So I have with us today, Samantha Holden, who is a behavioral neurologist at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. And she's gonna to talk to us today about Lewy body dementia and its relationship to PCA. And, um, and then we'll talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll take questions afterwards. And this will be recorded, God willing. <laughs> And, um, and it will be available uh, up on uh, my website at pca-vision.org and on our Facebook sites. So take it away, Dr. Holden. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to talk about something that's near and dear to my heart, which is Lewy body dementias, and uh, really explore how it is affecting conditions other than what we kind of consider the more traditional Parkinson's disease. And as we'll talk about, PCA is really actually intimately related to these conditions and making a difficult to diagnose condition even more difficult in terms of figuring out what the underlying cause is sometimes. Um, so starting with the basics here, what exactly is a Lewy body? A Lewy body, kind of somewhat similar to what we see in Alzheimer's disease, where there's these misfolded proteins that build up in the brain and cause these uh, plaques in the brain of Alzheimer's disease. Somewhat uh, analogously, in Lewy body dementias, there's a misfolded protein, but instead of amyloid, it's alpha-synuclein. And this alpha-synuclein protein kind of clumps up, it gets sticky, and then the brain cells can't get rid of it um, like they should be. Everybody actually has a lot of alpha-synuclein floating around in their body. It's actually about 1% of all the proteins in our body, but it's not sticky in most people. The problem is when it misfolds and starts clumping. So when this clumped alpha-synuclein starts building up, it starts damaging the brain cells that it lives in. And the brain cells effects more usually are those brain cells that make a certain chemical called dopamine. And dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's really important for a few different activities. Number one, for movement, kind of greasing the wheels, make it e making it easier to move. And it's also really important for reward. So when you're eating a bar of chocolate or you're playing slot machine, dopamine's going off in your brain to tell you, I like this, keep doing this. So when there's less dopamine in the brain, because the alpha-synuclein has damaged those cells that are making it, it makes it very hard for the body to move, making people slow and stiff, um, and can also cause something called apathy, where people just have no motivation or interest in things they used to enjoy because they don't have that reward signal. It can also affect the levels of another chemical called acetylcholine, which is really important for thinking and memory. And there are low levels of acetylcholine in Alzheimer's disease, but also in these Lewy body dementias as well. And the broader term that we use for these conditions is neurodegeneration, meaning that these brain cells are dying quicker than they should be, and then has downstream effects in terms of the functions of those areas being lost. And here's just a little picture, both a, a cartoon on the left here, as well as um, an actual picture from a microscope of a Lewy body. And it's inside, this is a, a nerve cell here, the body of the nerve cell, the neuron, and all of these kind of branch-like um, uh, projections called dendrites. And nerve cells receive information into these branches it kind of processes in the body and then gets shot down this long wire called an axon to the next brain cells next to it. This is a nucleus, if you remember from your high school biology, um, that's where all the DNA of the cell lives. But this big bubble here is the Lewy body and that should not be there. And this is an actual picture of a Lewy body from someone and it stains red. The pathologist put a special dye on it so it stains red in there and this bubble should not be there. With that bubble stuck there in the brain cell, it can't do the work that it's trying to do. So how do these Lewy bodies play a role in posterior cortical atrophy? So we know that the majority of the time when somebody does present with PCA, the underlying problem in the brain is Alzheimer's disease. There are those plaques and tangles that build up in the brain cells with amyloid and tau proteins. But the other 20% of the time, 
most common cause is this dementia with Lewy body's condition where this synuclein builds up in the brain. There are other possibilities, other neurodegenerative conditions, namely something called cortical basal degeneration, which is also a, a Parkinson's-like condition that has extra symptoms with it, where people can have a lot of stiffness or dystonia of their muscles. They can have apraxia, which is difficulty performing uh, learned motor movements. So um, how do you use a toothbrush? How do you comb your hair, putting a key in a lock? If people are having trouble with those kind of motor tasks, that could be a sign of something like cortical basal degeneration, but it's rare. Subcortical gliosis is kind of a fancy word that means that there's some scarring in the brain in certain areas. And then a prion disease is very rare, about one in a million. Um, the most common thing that people have usually heard of is mad cow disease. That was an epidemic in the UK in the 80s, where there is also a misfolded protein in the brain that can spread and usually causes a very rapid decline to death, really, in months, um, but thankfully is very rare. But really, if somebody doesn't have Alzheimer's changes in their brain, but they have the symptoms of PCA, it's very likely that dementia with Lewy bodies is actually the cause. And it's much less recognized, not only by people in the community, you know, everybody's heard of Alzheimer's, but very few people have heard of dementia with Lewy bodies. And then even neurologists very rarely diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies correctly. So it's one of my life missions to really make dementia with Lewy bodies as well recognized as Alzheimer's is. And why is that? So not only is it the second most common cause of PCA, it's the second most ca common cause of dementia, period. So Alzheimer's is again the most common, about 60 to 70% of people with dementia that's from a brain condition have Alzheimer's. But about 10 to 20% have dementia with Lewy bodies. And that's 1.4 million people in this country. And it can be difficult to diagnose correctly because it can look a little bit like Alzheimer's and look a little bit like Parkinson's. And oftentimes people are misdiagnosed with one or the other, but really it is more of this kind of overlap condition between the two called dementia with Lewy bodies. So a lot of the time it's missed or people are told that it is not dementia with Lewy bodies. That's what a false negative means. And at the first visit, the first time somebody sees the doctor, and usually it's a complaints about their memory or forgetfulness or maybe some trouble with their walking or balance, but the first time they see a neurologist, only 18% of people get the right diagnosis, 18%. And even at the last time they're seeing their doctor before they pass away, still only 29% have the right diagnosis. And they have to wait until after they pass away if they have an autopsy to see exactly what was going on in the brain. And that's just not acceptable to be giving people wrong diagnoses that frequently. And it takes about 18 months and three different doctors for people to get the right diagnosis of dementia with Lewy bodies. Which is why I take any and all opportunities, including this one, to be able to speak with you today um, about increasing awareness of this condition. Um, a few years ago now, um, it was in the news a little bit for an unfortunate reason. Um, if people remember Robin Williams, unfortunately, taking his own life a few years ago now in 2014. He had been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease a few months before he took his life. And he was having symptoms of hallucinations, which we're going to talk about as related to dementia with Lewy body. He did not let his doctors know, or it wasn't... Um, uh, enough. It's hard to say exactly what the details were, but after he took his life, he did have an autopsy, and his widow, Susan Schneider Williams, made it her life's mission to really be an advocate and get the word out there that Robin actually had dementia with Lewy bodies. And the pathologists who examined his brain after he passed away said it was one of the worst cases of the condition that they had ever seen in the brain. So even though it was that prominent in his brain and he was having symptoms and he was famous and wealthy, he still was misdiagnosed. So Susan Schneider Williams wrote this um, uh, editorial in our largest journal among the field of neurology. Um, and, and it's still the highest 
read article in that journal um, at this time um, about what she saw him going through and their experiences with this condition as a way to really get the word out there. And uh, these are just a couple of her quotes from that little editorial saying that she saw her brilliant husband being lucid with clear reasoning one minute and then five minutes later blank and lost in confusion. And that's a really important clue for what we look for in dementia with Lewy body, something called fluctuations, which we'll go into a little bit more. And um, something that was really poignant to me, this I, he just wanted to reboot his brain. So there were kind of periods of lucidity where he knew something was wrong, but was having trouble communicating that to his doctors. So making things even a little more complicated here, um, dementia with Lewy bodies, second most common cause of dementia, but the vast majority of people with dementia with Lewy bodies also have Alzheimer's changes in their brain. So very rarely is a condition, a brain condition, just one thing. And there have been larger studies that have been done on people when they, you know, very graciously donate their brains to science after they pass away. So you can look and see exactly what was going on in there. And it seems that really it's the rule rather than the exception that there's more than one change going on in the brain. And not only does that make it really difficult for us as clinicians to diagnose somebody in life because we don't have really good biomarkers. So we can put together, you know, clinical information, people's thinking and memory testing, their brain scans, their blood work, if they have a spinal tap and we look at their spinal fluid. But none of those, and even kind of all together, all of those features are still not perfect at predicting what's actually going on in the brain. And still the only way we can be positive is looking at a piece of the brain under a microscope. So 80% of the time, if somebody has Lewy body dementia and we see it clinically, we have ruled out other conditions, there's still amyloid plaques and tau tangles associated with Alzheimer's in the brain. On the flip side of that, people with Alzheimer's disease, where we've got done a thorough evaluation and we are pretty sure it's Alzheimer's disease, they still have Lewy bodies in their brain about 50% of the time. So these things overlap very intimately and can make it challenging to diagnose people correctly. And it's also gonna make changes for potential treatments in the future and hopefully cures because we can't just target amyloid or we can't just target Lewy bodies. We're probably gonna to have to target something that overlaps between the two. So how do we diagnose somebody with dementia with Lewy bodies? It was made somewhat simpler um, last year. There were new diagnostic criteria published, meaning that a lot of very smart people got together in a room somewhere and said, how do we define this disease? But people actually have to do that, um, and you have to do it in a uh, standardized way. Uh, you can't just make stuff up. So last year, they put out new diagnostic criteria for dementia with Lewy bodies that actually simplified things. Um, it's still complicated, but it's easier than it used to be. Um, and there are different levels of certainty that we can have when diagnosing somebody with dementia with Lewy bodies. So the only thing that's absolutely required to diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies is that somebody has dementia. And by dementia, we mean there's enough thinking and memory changes going on that somebody is no longer fully independent. And that could start with trouble with complicated things like paying bills, taking medications, driving, cooking, but can progress to needing help with basic tasks like getting dressed or bathing or eating. So dementia is required. The problem with that though is that people don't go from normal to dementia overnight. And there's this kind of in-between phase called mild cognitive impairment, where there's something going on. It's more than we would expect just for getting older, but people are still independent for the most part. But the current diagnostic criteria here don't allow for that. So someone must have dementia to diagnose dementia with Lewy bodies. And then they must have one or two of these core clinical features. So things that we can see when we talk and examine somebody. Those fluctuations that were mentioned in Robin Williams' um, case 
where one minute you could be completely with it and um, very lucid and having a good conversation. And then the next minute you're kind of out of it and um, you know, lights are on, but nobody's home and then you're back in and then you're back out. And when I ask people about this, people say, well, yeah, there's good days and bad days. And I think everybody has that. I certainly have good days and bad days, but with dementia with wooey bodies, it's good minutes and bad minutes and people can rapidly cycle between them and it can be very striking. The other thing that can happen is sometimes uh, people can have fluctuations, not just in their level of alertness or interaction, but also fluctuations in their other symptoms, namely things like hallucinations or delusions, which we're gonna talk about next. So hallucinations are seeing, hearing, feeling, smelling, or tasting, pretty much any scent, any sense that you have, things that are not actually there. So it's creating something, your brain is creating something in the absence of input. Visual hallucinations are the most common in dementia with Lewy body, and they're usually well-formed people or animals, and they're not always scary. Sometimes they're nice, um, but they are, uh, can be very prominent, and especially more in like the evenings when there's less ambient light around. REM behavior disorder, the next one here, is a very important clue. And every single person that I see in my clinic with thinking and memory trouble, I ask about acting out dreams. And we're gonna talk about it a little bit more in detail in the other slides, but it is a very strong clue that there are Lewy bodies in the brain. It's not sleepwalking or sleep talking, it's physically acting out the plot of your dream while you should be paralyzed in REM sleep. And then lastly, there should be some Parkinsonism, which means looks like Parkinson's. And we're gonna talk about exactly what those symptoms are too. This last column over here are other tests that can be done. A DAT scan is a specialized brain scan where a dye can be injected into a vein and it will bind to dopamine in the brain and tell us how much dopamine's floating around in there. There's less dopamine than there should be that could be a sign of Parkinson's or Lewy body. This MIBG scan is a special heart scan that we don't have to go into the details, but it can tell us how um, much input the heart is getting from the brain, and that's actually decreased a little bit in people with Lewy body. And then the last one is a sleep study where you go to a lab and you sleep hooked up to a bunch of wires to your brain and to your body um, and your breathing uh, to see if you're acting out those dreams while you're sleeping. So to say that somebody probably has dementia with Lewy bodies, they have to have that dementia and then two of those core clinical features, which are the fluctuations, the hallucinations, acting out of dreams, or looking like you have Parkinson's, you're slow or stiff or shaky. You can also diagnose it if you have one of those features but then one of those tests is abnormal, the brain scan, the heart scan, or the sleep study. You can also say someone possibly has dementia with Lewy bodies with just one of either of those. So it's really not that high of a threshold to diagnose these things. And neurologists sometimes think that you have to have all of those features to say that somebody has Lewy body but that's not correct. And that's how you can misdiagnose people. So this is um, a long list of other things that we can see in dementia with Lewy bodies, not always, but they can be good hints if they are present. They don't have to be though. Neuroleptics are medications that are used to treat psychosis. And by psychosis, I mean hallucinations or delusions, which are false fixed beliefs, usually paranoid or um, infidelity or somebody's out to get you type uh, thoughts, even if there's no evidence for those um, thoughts. Hallucinations in other modalities, so not visual things like seeing people or animals, but maybe hearing things, music or voices or static, um, feeling things. I have some patients who feel um, like little bugs on their skin or convinced that there's something um, crawling on them. Um, smelling, I have some people who always smell something, um, either pleasant or unpleasant, even though there's not something there. 
The delusions I mentioned um, briefly, so those are those false fixed beliefs, which can be very difficult for people and their family members to deal with, especially if there's thoughts of, you know, the spouse cheating on the, the person or, or things like that. Um, falling is a good clue. Syncope, which is loss of consciousness, people pass out. Autonomic dysfunction, the autonomic nervous system is all the automatic things in our body. So our breathing, our heart rate, our bowel and bladder function, our sweating and temperature regulation. So people are having a lot of constipation or trouble um, releasing their bladder and urinating called retention, or they're really sweaty. Um, those are also clues that there might be Lewy bodies in the brain. Hyposmia is a fancy word for loss of sense of smell. Um, and that happens in a lot of brain conditions, not just Lewy body, but it can happen even 10, 20 years before other symptoms start. Hypersomnia means sleeping too much, kind of all throughout the day, even if you're getting a good night's sleep. And then mood symptoms like depression, apathy, which is that loss of motivation or interest in things that you used to enjoy. It's not sadness, it's just kind of blah. Um, or anxiety can also be clues. And then on the right side here are just some more tests that we do. Um, usually we get at least one picture of somebody's brain, hopefully an MRI, which gives us a much prettier picture of the brain than a CAT scan, but one or the other, mostly to make sure we're not missing something else like strokes or tumors or bleeding in the brain, but there can also be clues on the MRI as to what part of the brain is involved based on the pattern of changes of the volume of the brain. So if there's shrinkage in certain areas, that can be a clue about what's going on inside the brain. An FDG PET scan is a specialized brain scan that looks at activity levels in the brain, um, how active different brain cell regions are. And again, a special dye is injected that binds actually to glucose or sugar in the brain areas that are eating up a lot of the sugar are active and turned on and the ones that aren't are kind of quieter and turned off and the pattern of activity can help us diagnose somebody too and then uh, a brain wave test called an EEG which is usually done to look for seizures or epilepsy um, but can also be helpful in diagnosing dementia with Lewy bodies so I, in my clinic, um, mostly see people with thinking and memory problems, and there are usually other features going on. You just have to kind of ask the right questions to get at them. But because of what I do with both thinking and memory trouble as well as movement disorders, so people moving too much or not enough, and the most common one being Parkinson's is what we see, I have a lot of people come to my clinic asking if they might have Parkinson's disease too even if they've already been diagnosed with something like Alzheimer's or PCA. If there is another brain condition going on, especially a neurodegenerative one where those brain cells are dying faster than they should be, in the later stages of any of those conditions, there will be some slowness, stiffness, trouble walking, trouble with balance, and maybe even a tremor or shakiness. What we wanna look for are those symptoms early on. So all of these conditions kind of meet at a, a common final ending point when more of the brain is involved by the process, but that doesn't mean that somebody also has Parkinson's or also has dementia with Lewy bodies. So that's this caveat here that you don't have dementia with Lewy bodies, even if you meet these other criteria, whether it's the hallucinations or the fluctuations or the stiffness or slowness. But if those happen at the later stages of the disease where people are already having a lot of trouble and needing a lot of help day to day, then that doesn't necessarily mean that the diagnosis is different. Another reason why we like to see people as early as possible in our clinics, even at the first, you know, and even if your tests are all completely normal, but you're worried that something's different, something's going on, come and see us. Um, you know, I have a lot of people say, well, I wasn't sure, I thought I was just getting older, or I thought, you know, it was because I wasn't sleeping or this. It doesn't matter, get checked out. And we're happy to see anybody, but especially early on so that we can get a good handle on things as early as possible. 
So another summary slide, what dementia with Lewy bodies is. So there is some thinking and memory trouble, but it has to start early on and it can't be Parkinson's disease. Now there's a lot of disagreements in the field if we should be separating all these conditions into different categories like this, because it just makes it a little bit more complicated. But for, for now, dementia with Lewy bodies is its own diagnosis where there's thinking and memory trouble. There is also some trouble moving with slowness or stiffness or shakiness. It starts at the same time. In Parkinson's disease, there is trouble moving first, but thinking and memory is fine. Thinking and memory can later be involved in Parkinson's years down the road, but it should not be at the start. And that's how we separate Parkinson's from dementia with Lewy bodies. What came first and what was more prominent. The acting out of dreams, that REM behavior disorder, which is a really important clue, the hallucinations and delusions, and then these fluctuations, these ups and downs in somebody's ability to interact um, and be aware of what's going on. So I've used this word a lot, um, Parkinsonism. If you ever see ism at the end of a word, it means looks like. So Parkinsonism is a more general word that means looks like Parkinson's disease, but doesn't have to be Parkinson's disease. You can have Parkinsonism due to strokes, you can have Parkinsonism due to medication side effects, and you can have Parkinsonism due to Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. You can also have Parkinsonism due to Alzheimer's, as I mentioned, as the disease progresses. There are three major symptoms of Parkinsonism. Slowness of movement, and the Latin word for that medically is bradykinesia, means slow movement. Rigidity, which is stiffness or tightness of the muscles, and then a tremor, which is a shakiness, usually in Parkinson's disease, is in the hands and is a little slow and kind of twists side to side like this. Um, and usually that happens when people are relaxed at rest and goes away when they go to move their hands or do something, which separates it from a different type of tremor called essential tremor, where people don't shake at rest, but the second they try to do something with their hands, they become shaky again. And the example I use of that condition is Katherine Hepburn, um, where her head and her voice were kind of shaky, as were her hands. But that is not Parkinson's disease. It's a separate condition. The slowness, stiffness, and shakiness often cause people to be imbalanced, fall, have trouble with their walking. The Parkinsonism that we see in dementia with Lewy bodies, again, as opposed to Parkinson's disease, where we're trying to separate out these conditions from one another, is usually more mild. And a lot of the time, people don't even complain about it to me. So they come to my clinic and they say, I'm having trouble with my thinking and memory, or their family is saying they're having trouble with their thinking and memory. And they don't say they're stiff or slow or shaky, but when I examine them, I pick it up because I'm looking for it, but it could be easily missed if you weren't looking for it. And usually it's not kind of screaming out at you, like when you see somebody with Parkinson's and they're shaky and they're kind of stooped or shuffling and you can see it more obviously, that is usually not the case in dementia with Lewy bodies. The resting tremor is usually not there, and if it is there, it's very mild and might come and go. And up to 40% of people with dementia with Lewy bodies never get Parkinsonism. They're not slow or stiff or shaky. So then what do we look for otherwise to make the correct diagnosis? Again, we have to make sure it's not from another cause, main ones being strokes or medications. The hallucinations, um, as I mentioned, are usually visual. They are people, animals. They're usually not scary or threatening. I have um, several patients I see who see um, dogs or bunnies or children. I have some people who see um, loved ones who have passed away and they visit with them and, and they enjoy it. Um, I have some people who see um, topless women and they enjoy that and they don't want that treat, uh, treated per se. Um, and then some people see more kind of um, complex scenes, kind of like uh, out of a movie, 
Um, it's usually kind of out their window. They'll see things on the on the um, yard that are going on and like a circus or um, I have somebody who sees kind of an old timey Western scene um, on their yard. Um, and usually people have the insight to know that it's not real. Um, as long as it's not something scary or threatening that they're acting upon, we don't have to treat it. There can also be more mild visual um, hallucinations, which um, really are more called illusions. So instead of seeing something that really is not there at all, you see something, but your brain misinterprets it. So um, an example we give is there's kind of a, a floor lamp in the corner and you see it and you think a person's standing over there or you look at the leaves in the tree and you see kind of faces or animals in the pattern of the leaves on the tree. Um, and again, if you don't ask people about these things, they may not bring it up, bring it up if they don't think that it is um, relevant in any way. And this is actually a common feature that we see in dementia with Lewy bodies. But if you don't ask about it, like we saw in the case with Robin Williams, people will not necessarily bring it up with you because they might be worried that they're going crazy or something else is wrong. Um, so we have to make sure we uh, probe. There's a test that we can do in our clinic to see if people are having those visual illusions. Um, where we present uh, some cards with images on them and we see if you see a face or not. And I'm going to show you a couple examples. So um, this is something called the pareidolia test, which was um, uh, developed by a team in Japan and it's open access. They share it um, with whoever's um, interested in using it. And they're kind of these ink blot kind of swatchy um, cards and there's about 40 of them. And the instructions are, I'm going to show you these cards. Some of them have faces, some of them do not. I want you to tell me if you see a face or not. So this one is an example of a face card. There's a face up here in the top right corner. And then this one does not have a face. But when I present these cards to people who have dementia with Lewy bodies, very frequently they'll start seeing faces in here where there's not. Um, and on this card, especially kind of in this bottom right corner, they see eyes and a beard and a head down here. And it's not necessarily unusual to look for faces where there are not faces. Um, there's even websites devoted to um, kind of seeing faces in everyday um, uh, things you come across where you see like a little um, uh, a fire hydrant that has like little screws on it and the nose and you see faces. It's a natural thing for humans to do. Um, you know, ever since we were babies, we're very attracted to faces. But if I'm showing people these cards and we go through all 40 of them and they're seeing things that are not really there on these cards, then that's going to be a little bit of a red flag that there might be illusions. Back to those fluctuations, those ups and downs with good minutes and bad minutes. This can be very prominent and it's not good days, bad days. It is something that can turn on a dime. And it might not be something that people are aware of unless you ask people who are around them um, who, you know, might be having a conversation and then, you know, the person's totally out of it and then they're back. Um, so it's important to ask about. And then this REM behavior disorder, which is acting out of dreams. When we are in REM sleep, which is the deepest phase of our sleep, when we dream, it's actually very active. Our brain is on, and if you were looking at the brain waves, you would think the person was awake, but they're in sleep and their body is paralyzed. So when we are in REM sleep, we're paralyzed. Our little eyes are moving around. That's the rapid eye movement part of it, but our body is paralyzed. For people with REM behavior disorder, that paralysis is lost and the muscles stay active when they shouldn't be. And that allows them to act out their dreams, usually more violent kind of active dreams, you know, punching, kicking, putting their bed partner in a headlock, you know, jumping out of the bed, flipping the bed over. Um, it can be very um, active and violent. But if you don't ask if people are doing this or try to separate it out from sleepwalking and sleep talking, which are different, those don't happen in REM sleep. And usually sleepwalkers' eyes are open and people with REM behavior disorder, their eyes are closed. It's kind of an easy way to separate. But if you are doing this, 
even you know, 20, 30, 50 years before you have trouble with your thinking and memory, there's about a 97% chance that there's Lewy bodies in the brain. So this is one of the very rare situations where we have a strong link between something somebody's experiencing and what might be going on inside their brain from a, a pathological level with the changes in the proteins. And we have really good lead time here. This can happen up to 50 years before somebody develops Parkinson's or Lewy body. So it's a, a really important area of research to figure out how closely they're connected, how long the lead time is, so that if we do develop a cure for these conditions, we could start it even before they have trouble with their memory or their movement. Um, and this is an example, the video is not great, um, but in the left corner here is a man that's sleeping. He has Parkinson's disease and he is in REM sleep. He should be completely still and paralyzed, but he's kind of gesturing here. He's pushing somebody away, beckoning them forward, um, and maybe even playing a violin there. Um, so this is REM behavior disorder. It's a more mild case. He's not hurting anybody. You know, he's trying to, he's swinging at somebody there. Um, but somebody should not be moving at all in this phase of sleep. And the background here is um, their, the brain waves, the muscle um, activity levels, and his breathing and heart rate from his sleep study. Um, so if somebody's doing this, good link to Lewy bodies in the brain. So then bringing it back to PCA. So when somebody presents with the symptoms of PCA to our clinic, the vast majority of the time, it's due to Alzheimer's changes in the brain, but when it's not, it's probably going to be Lewy body. But how do we know that without looking at a piece of the brain under a microscope? And we don't do that, not while anybody would miss that piece of the brain. So if there is Parkinsonism, if people are slow or stiff or shaky, and usually it's going to be subtle, it's not going to be kind of screaming out at us, we have to check, um, and, and hopefully with a thorough neurological examination, then it might be Lewy body going on and not Alzheimer's. Visual hallucinations can be hard because sometimes those can happen in PCA due to Alzheimer's too. But if they're more prominent, especially if these, they're, they are these well-formed people or animals, it's another good clue. And those fluctuations or ups and downs usually don't happen in Alzheimer's. Good days, bad days, but not good minutes, bad minutes and that acting out of dreams. That's probably the biggest clue we have that it's Lewy body. That's the underlying cause of PCA rather than Alzheimer's changes because people with Alzheimer's do not act out their dreams like that man we just saw. And then if we do more thorough testing like a spinal tap to look at levels of different proteins in the spinal fluid or a amyloid PET scan that'll light up those amyloid plaques in the brain. It's not yet available clinically. We're hoping it will be soon, um, but there will be a more specific PET scan that sees the plaques in the brain. So if those plaques aren't there, then it's not Alzheimer's. But if somebody has PCA with no amyloid plaques, then more than likely it's gonna be dementia with Lewy bodies going on. Um, this is just a, a quick little um, questionnaire that was developed by a researcher, Dr. Galvin, who's down in Florida. And this is 10 yes no questions. It's called the Lewy Body Composite Risk Score. And it's openly available. You can Google it and find it. And every single person I see, again, with thinking and memory trouble, including people with more visual symptoms like PCA, they get this 10 yes no question. If there are three or more yeses, to any of these questions, then there is a very good chance that it's actually Lewy body. So it's a quick, easy way to screen. And if you don't ask, you're not going to find it. So I try to make every neurologist I know who's seeing people with thinking and memory trouble, with PCA, with movement trouble, ask these questions. And it is just the symptoms that we just went over in terms of the slowness, the shakiness, the fluctuations, the trouble with um, acting out dreams, hallucinations, but just kind of compiled into one short questionnaire. Um, and just again, if three or more yeses on that, there's a really high risk, over 90% that it's Lewy body. 
And then just a brief plug here, um, something that Dr. Pellick and I work on together here at the University of Colorado um, is a new initiative um, from the Lewy Body Dementia Association, LBDA, um, which is a um, national nonprofit um, educational and uh, outreach organization for supporting people with Lewy body and their um, families and loved ones, educating not only on um, the community, but neurologists and other um, physicians as well. And then um, coming up with new treatments and clinical trials. So in 2017, they sent out a request for applications for um, medical centers across the country to become centers of excellence. And while it sounds you know, nice and fancy, you can put a plaque on your wall, the more important part of it is that this network of medical centers are gonna be working together to not only educate and um, increase awareness of Lewy body dementias and bring its recognition up on, uh, on par with Alzheimer's disease, which is kind of always the leading headline, um, but also that we can all work together with um, clinicians and researchers to understand these conditions better, including their link to things like PCA, and ultimately come up with better treatments and cures. Um, so here at the University of Colorado, we are one of 24 centers across the country, and we're kind of the only one in our time zone over here, um, but I work very closely with Dr. Pellet and we are working on bringing in recognition of the visual symptoms um, and the um, connection to PCA to this overarching uh, research project here. Um, and with that, ooh, right on time, 10.44. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, um, even if it's not specifically about Louis body, um, I am happy to answer whatever I can, but my email is also here and I'm happy to um, answer um, any further questions or, or help however I can. But thanks for the opportunity to talk to everybody um, about something that I think is really important and hopefully we can work on getting the word out together. Thank you so much. Now, so we're going to take questions. For some reason, I can't see people. So I'm going Maybe if to... I stop sharing my screen, do you think that might help? I don't know. Let's see. Um, okay, I see <laughs> someone here. <laughs> Our video. Um, okay, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we, uh, if anybody has a question, you can see people, right? I can, yeah. see, I can see me now, but why don't you put yourself back on so, so you could see people. Uh, and, and if anybody has a question, raise their hand and, and uh, Dr. Holden will, yes, go ahead. Yes, uh, I was wondering if blue bodies uh, show up in any particular area of the brain. Like in, in uh, PCA, it's always in the, in the posterior part of the mm -hmm. brain. Yeah, yeah, really good question. Um, there doesn't really seem to be any uh, good rhyme or reason to where they show up in Lewy body. Um, it used to be thought that they start more in the uh, bottom part of the brain and the brain stem and midbrain and then kind of spread up through the whole cortex, the outer crust of the brain. Um, but that really doesn't seem to be holding um, because after people pass away and we look under a microscope, they're kind of scattered. Um, and there isn't a good connection between where we see the Lewy bodies and what type of symptoms the person was having necessarily. Um, there usually are some Lewy bodies back in those posterior regions in the occipital lobe too. Um, and some hypotheses that that might be why people are hallucinating in Lewy body so frequently, but we still just don't understand it as well as we should yet. Yeah. But, um, any other questions? I see Connie. Yeah, hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I'm, I'm interested to know if you have any association with orthostatic tremor and um, and also Lewy bodies. Um, and the reason yeah. I ask is because I was diagnosed with that first before I got my PCA. Ah. I, thought, I thought on your list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so orthostatic tremor is an interesting one. Um, it's a tremor that, ha for everybody else, it's a tremor that usually happens in the legs when you first stand up and it's a very high frequency tremor. Um, but then when you walk, it kind of goes away. Um, and it's kind of one of those um, still medical mysteries for us. We're not exactly sure why it happens. 
Oh, it does seem to be uh, benign in that it doesn't usually cause any um, other neurological problems. It usually doesn't progress to involve other parts um, of the brain or cause, you know, uh, later Parkinson's or Lewy body or dementia or anything like that. So it does kind of seem to be just kind of one of those quirks so far. Um, but a lot of people have said that also about essential tremor, the one I mentioned with um, uh, Catherine Hepburn, where people's voice and their hands are shaky when they're doing things with their hands. And that used to be called benign essential tremor, meaning, ah, it's not that big of a deal. But it causes people a lot of problems and can be very disabling for them. So they took the benign away. And then now we're starting to find that there is a strong connection between essential tremor and Parkinson's disease, and that might be related to um, some genetics that are shared between them. So um, it's an in interesting question. I think orthostatic tremor is fascinating, but we just haven't studied it well enough yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Rachel, yes. Go ahead. Um. George. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. This is George. I don't have the name right on my things here. <laughs> um, George and Carmela. Yeah, so you, I, I don't know if you said it or I saw it somewhere that um, something on the order of 50% of late onset um, Alzheimer's patients, uh, you know, have signs of uh, Lewy bodies, pathological. Yeah. And I was just curious to your different, your uh, identifying uh, people with uh, Lewy bodies, whether that really applies in that, in, in, in all scenarios, or if it's more just localized to people that are uh, sort of developing Lewy bodies early on and not so much showing the Alzheimer's or... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what makes it really hard because we only know that um, if we look at the brain under a microscope. So um, somebody can look all the world like run-of-the-mill, regular Alzheimer's, you know, there's mostly memory trouble and not PCA, just kind of typical memory changes in Alzheimer's. And then if they have an autopsy, about half the time there's also Lewy bodies in their brain. And they might have had no signs of Parkinsonism, no hallucinations, nothing in life, but those Lewy bodies were still in there. So could it have been if they had lived longer? And, you know, even if people live, you know, to 100, 110, 120, live longer, would they have gotten symptoms of the Lewy, dementia with Lewy bodies? It's kind of still up in the air. We're not sure yet. But most of these neurological studies that are coming out show that people with neurological conditions more often than have more than one type of thing going on in their brain. Okay. That might be why so many clinical trials have failed because you're saying, okay, we're going to include people with all memory trouble and, you know, they have a little bit of shrinkage of their memory centers on their brain scan. But in that collection of people, there's going to be so much heterogeneity in terms of some people have some Lewy bodies and some people might have something else. And it, it's very hard to um, specify exactly one type of Alzheimer's without right now having a piece of brain. Um, so that's why there's a lot of research going on looking for biomarkers. So is there something, whether it's a test, um, a blood test, a brain scan, uh, an eye test, you know, people doing research on these um, uh, special pictures of the retina. Um, and is there something that's more specific as an indirect way to see what's exactly inside of somebody's brain when they have these types of symptoms? So, uh, Thank you. Reversing the question a little, I guess, um, of the people that are, I know your uh, guidelines for Lewy body are relatively new. Of yeah. the people that, that test positive, is there any view on the percentage of those that then also test positive for the biomarkers or whatever for Alzheimer's? Yeah, so the people who we think have Lewy body in life, they 80% of the time have Alzheimer's plaques and tangles. Yeah, so 80% oh. one way, 50% the other way. Yeah. Oh. Okay. It's, it's very messy. Got you. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just ask a question about uh, treating alpha synuclein? I mean, yeah, not yet. Yeah, we're trying. Um, Alzheimer's uh, research is certainly um, ahead of the game in terms of coming up with uh, treatments, mostly um, infusion treatments that are um, antibody-like treatments that can bind up the amyloid and get it out. And we've shown we can do that. And there were um, two drugs that have been presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in July that look promising to get amyloid out and that it seems to be helping. But there have not been as many trials with getting this nuclein out. 
Um, there's one larger trial that's being funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's Research um, that's a quote unquote uh, synuclein vaccine um, as an, a way to kind of get that synuclein out. Um, one of our researchers here at the university, Dr. Kurt Reed, was working on a medication to get amyloid out, uh, to get alpha-synuclein out. But the problem is, as I mentioned, alpha-synuclein is 1% of all of the protein in your body. And how do you target just the bad alpha-synuclein and not the good one? Because it actually does something important when it's folded correctly. And you can't just clear it all out. Um, which is kind of different from Alzheimer's, where amyloid kind of is always bad. Um, and so it's never really helping things much. Um, so we have to be a little bit more targeted with the synuclein. Um, but we're definitely at least a few decades behind the Alzheimer's research, unfortunately. What, what do we, I mean, we, we know, well, amyloid is important when, in its, its uh, soluble, insoluble form, but not yes. in its accumulated yeah, form. Constantly. And also, but what do we do? We know anything about what normal alpha synuclein is for? If it's so common, yeah, it kind it's really um, integrated in a lot of different um, cellular mechanisms. And uh, Dr. Freed, who's a PhD doctor, he gives these lectures every once in a while, and it's kind of one of those charts where there's like a million different you know enzymes <laughs> and connections. And you're just like, oh my god, you're having flashbacks to biochemistry as an under. Um, it's really important in um, a lot of kind of cellular energy mechanisms and um, also like stabilization of like microtubules, I think. It does like a lot of different things um, and it just seems to be involved in so many processes that it can be hard to uh, target it more specifically. There are um, knockout mice, genetically bred mice that um, don't make the alpha synuclein and they're really sick. Um, there's a gene called DJ1 which can also um, be uh, abnormal in humans and cause a really severe early onset form of Parkinson's disease too. But I think we're still kind of working through the exact biochemistry of it. Any other questions? Raise your hand. Marilyn, I see you're here, but you're on mute. So I'm gonna unmute you just in case you have a question. <laughs> I think you have to unmute yourself because mm -hmm. unmute. Okay. There we go. Yep. Yeah, I just was getting some dings from text and I didn't want to disturb <laughs> everyone. Apologies for joining late. It's, it's early enough on the West Coast that there was a morning routine with my husband. Mm -hmm. um, if you've covered this, let me know and you can answer offline so that others aren't. Um, but my husband was diagnosed with PCA older than most. He was 72 at the time. He just turned 79. So in year seven, he's really at stage six right now and needs help with everything. And just recently, his, his anxiety and panic have been the major issues. But in the last week and a half, he's starting to have some delusions and we call them hallucinations, telling us very calmly about a man following him. Um, and we're, we're skilled in handling that, but it's a new behavior. And also just very recently, he's pounding and saying, this is not my house, I wanna get out of here. So it's those behaviors that he hasn't exhibited before. I heard what you said about perhaps the presence of Lewy bodies. Doug Galasco is our neurologist. Do you oh, know right. that? I'm sure you know yep. that. Mm -hmm. yep. And yep. he and I are in frequent contact and I haven't told him about these two latest episodes. And mm. from the start, because of Lou's age, he was wondering whether Louis bodies might be involved, but um, at the work workup that was done seven years ago, there wasn't any presence. Okay. Um, and uh, there weren't any behaviors to suggest that Lou does have some cortical basal interference. But mm -hmm. given what I've just said, does it sound mm -hmm. like maybe there are some Lewy bodies that may be present? And we, we are signed up to have the brain biopsy done. Okay. Yeah. Matter. Yeah, so um, kind of uh, one of those um, caveats in the diagnostic criteria for uh, Lewy bodies is that the symptoms mm -hmm. start in the later stages of a dementia. Mm -hmm. whether that is the slowness or stiffness or the delusions. And kind of as these neurodegenerative diseases progress, they all kind of meet a common endpoint. And so the symptoms usually become very um, overlapping in the late stages. Um, so I don't know if it... Um, the thing is, though, because there are also Lewy bodies so commonly in Alzheimer's disease, does that 
mean that's why those things are happening in the late stages of the disease. You know, it, it still um, remains to be seen how these co-pathologies, where there's more than one thing going on in there, how that manifests. And just because the Alzheimer's process is affecting more parts of the brain, that might not be the only explanation for those additional symptoms that happen in later Hello. stages. Yeah, thanks. And so then the question is, you know, so I'm actually finishing up the conference and I'm out of time. Somebody else is talking. Um, but yeah, so in terms of managing symptoms, um, you know, we have to be really careful with symptoms like uh, hallucinations and delusions because almost all of the medications that are used to treat them have very high side effects, um, especially in older people with memory trouble. So it's that kind of weighing the risks and benefits of things. There are some medications that are a little gentler with fewer side effects, but I try to avoid pills unless we really have to. But if there is a safety issue in terms of, you know, the person being really distressed or acting on, you know, their hallucinations or delusions or, you know, uh, lashing out at their partners, you know, if there's any safety issues, then we kind of say, well, the, the benefits of treating it with a medication outweigh the risks at that point. Uh, that's that's where that's where we are. Thank you so much. Of course. Thanks for attending. Anybody else have a question or a final comment? Everybody good? That was very interesting. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody, this is going to be taped, so uh, it will be up online. Uh, if anybody has a problem with your your names being like your comments, let me know and I'll have to figure out how to edit that out. But otherwise, that this is our, our support groups are not taped. But this is a lecture series, so this will be online. Thank you, everybody. Don't forget our PCA patient caregiver support group meets on Friday at 5 o'clock Eastern time. We have a really, really cool guest this time. We usually don't have a guest, but this guest is going to take us through all of the forms and Medicaid and Medicare and everything you need to know about, you know, working the system and getting what you need for uh, PCA uh, benefits. So thank you all. Uh, just email me if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Holden. You were terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.